Hello, hello. This is Flip Notes 1.2 for AP Psychology, and we are moving from the history of early psych to contemporary or modern psychology. So let's get to it. Um, our learning targets here, again, we're looking at the contributions of major historical figures, uh, comparing the different theoretical approaches. We're going to look at several more and seeing what some of the strengths and limitations are of some of those theories when we're trying to actually apply them to behavior. So we had finished talking up about Sigmund Freud and the psychoanalytic theory. Um, the next theory to develop was behaviorism. And here they're really starting to redefine psychology. I mean, it had been redefined with Freud's study of the unconscious mind, but behaviorism becomes one of the branches that does really carry into today, into modern psychology. Um, our next major contributor is John B. Watson. We've got young John Watson here and older John Watson as well. This is the one that the bottom one is the one I recognize a little bit more. He's American, um, famous in psychology um, as the founder of behaviorism. So behaviorism um, is the idea that psychology should only study what can be observed and measured objectively. So this is a total change from what Freud was talking about. Freud's talking about this deep level of the unconscious mind that we are completely unaware of. But Watson is saying no. He totally disagreed with that, with everybody in his field, uh, and said, we're not going to worry about these thoughts and hidden parts of the mind. That's not relevant. We just want to look at observable behavior. So the study of consciousness becomes completely abandoned. Um, Freud was right at the turn of the century, right around, the, right around 1900, uh, and behaviorism becomes more popular around the 1920s to 1960s. Uh, not long after Watson, B.F. Skinner will be the next to continue behaviorism. Um, and, but again, still only looking at external factors that are shaping behavior, what is affecting our behavior. Uh, we define psychology today as the study of behavior, what we do, and mental processes. We talked about that. So they are taking today into account our observable behaviors, but we are bringing into mind what's going on in our mind. Um, there's two main factors that influence behavior, and we consider those to be nature and nurture. When we say nature, we're talking about the way you were born, the way mother, mother nature made you. Controversy over whether human traits and behaviors are based on your biology. So when we're talking about nature, we're talking about genes, uh, inborn traits. You were born this way versus nurture that says you were nurtured by your environment to become that way. So these are traits that are based off environmental experiences um, or the environment and your experiences or nurture. So in the nature versus nurture debate, the behaviorist side says that it is all nurture. So the debate over whether behavior is determined by genetic inheritance is nature, environment and experience is nurture. So John Watson has a pretty famous quote. He said, and I kind of picture him saying this sort of like in an evil voice like Mr. Skinner from The Simpsons, but maybe not. He said, give me a dozen healthy infants, well formed in my own special world to bring them up in. And I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant chief, and yes, even beggar man and thief. So what he was saying is you are born that tabula rasa, the blank slate, and you can be taught anything. Anything is what he believed. And so the behavior school of thought emphasizes the environment or nurture. So how do we study this? How do we figure out if something is the result of nature or nurture? Are you born that way? Or did you learn it from your environment? Um, and researchers have found the best way to study this is by looking at identical twins, so through twin studies. So with identical twins, they're gonna have the same DNA. Their environment depends on how they were raised. If they were raised together in the same household, they're gonna have the same environment. Uh, the alternative, 
um, are identical twins who are raised in different environments, like perhaps one was adopted or they were both adopted by different families. So if we have pair one, they have the same DNA and the same environment. If their intelligence is different, then we can assume that there are tiny differences in the environment, that they maybe had different friends, time spent studying, that maybe their parents treated them differently, and that's what caused the difference. However, if they grew up in very similar environments that they had the same friends, their parents taught, taught, treated them the same way, they had the same teachers, if their environment was almost exactly the same, but they still have very different intelligence, uh, sorry, if their intelligence is the same, it's hard to tell if it's due to genetics or environment. So ideally then, we would want to study identical twins that have a different environment. Um, twins adopted by different families grow up in different environments. So if intelligence is the same, it's likely due to their genes. If intelligence is different, then it's likely due to their environment. So anything that's the same, we're going to assume it's from their genes because that's what they have in common. If it's different, they grew up in a different environment, but they have the same genes, we can assume it was their environment that influenced them. Uh, and then our fourth pair here, different DNA, same environment. One sibling is adopted. If their intelligence is the same, it's likely due to the environment. If intelligence is different, it is likely due to genetics. Now, intelligence is one of the ones that's actually very complicated as far as is it nature or nurture. And we're going to watch a video clip in class that explains that a little bit more. All right. Um, continuing on in the field of behaviorism, um, was the most influential of all psychologists, and that was B.F. Skinner. Uh, B.F. Skinner was an American psychologist, lived all the way until 1990. Uh, and he also said that environmental factors determine behavior. Uh, and specifically, that when you get a positive outcome to something, you're more likely to repeat that behavior. And when something negative outcome, when you have a negative outcome or a negative response, then you don't repeat that. So basically, you like the reward, you do it again. You don't like the punishment, you don't do it again. And he was real big on studying reinforcement, rewards, and punishments. And we'll get to all of that in a different chapter. Um, but he also becomes controversial, kind of how Freud was. They're all kind of controversial. Uh, because this idea that your environment is influencing your behavior kind of goes against this idea that you have free will, that you can do whatever you want. But both Watson and Skinner are saying, I can train you to do whatever I want, that I can influence your behavior. Um, so that makes people uncomfortable, this idea that you are being shaped by your environment, but you're thinking, but I have free will. I can do whatever I want. But can you? Are you being shaped by your environment? Um, the APA sent out a survey, I don't know, it's probably been 20 years now, um, asking psychologists and people in the field who they felt was the most influential, influential American psychologist, and Skinner was voted the number one, so considered the most influential American psychologist. Um, by the 1950s, this idea of, um, that, um, that humans can't control their behavior, that we're run by our unconscious mind, was becoming very unpopular. So a new field develops in opposition to psychoanalytic theory and behaviorism, and that field is humanism. So both of the early ones were, they humanists said that psychoanalytic and behaviorism were dehumanizing. So humanism develops. Um, our main person here, and the one who is the founder of humanism, is Abraham Maslow. He's just kind of this cheery, happy looking guy, I think. Uh, and Carl Rogers. Um, who will talk again, we'll talk about all these people some more in each unit. Um, but the humanistic point of view emphasizes the unique qualities of humans, the idea that we do have freedom and that we should focus on personal growth. Um, probably the hallmark of the humanistic point of view um, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which we'll actually talk about um, pretty early in the year here. Um, but he says that we have physiological needs, basic needs that have to be met safety needs, social needs, esteem, and then we can become self-actualized. Carl Rogers has uh, been most influential in treatment. So these humanistic 
or not dehumanizing humans. Um, these theories are applied to therapy quite often today, and that's where Carl Rogers uh, became famous with his person-centered therapy. Um, our next perspective uh, in psychology or place that the field kind of geared toward uh, was in cognition. So it says here we're putting the psyche back in psychology. Remember from the very first lesson that psyche refers to the mind and they had kind of gotten away from studying the mind, that they were studying behaviors with Watson and um, Skinner. So, but now it comes back to, well, but we want to know how we think. So cognition, keyword here, and it's a fancy word that we'll use all year, cognitive, cognition, and it means thinking or mental processes involved in acquiring knowledge. So cognitive psychology is all about the mental processes. Um, so 1950s and 1960s, some of our major people in this section would, will be Jean Piaget, that's this guy, Noam Chomsky, and Theodore Simone. Um, so they're applying scientific methods to studying the mind. So not like Freud, who's studying the unconscious mind. Here, this is like, like working memory and our thoughts. So, and this becomes maybe a new dominant perspective. Today, we're still wondering, like, how, what is it that we think about? How do we think about stuff? Why are we thinking about that? Uh, but we're studying it in a more scientific way. Piaget, um, we'll talk about him a lot in the child development chapter about why do children think differently than adults, that their brains actually don't allow them to think quite the same way that an adult does. So this is the cognition perspective. Um, the next major perspective is the biological psychology perspective or the biological basis of behavior. So this is using um, physiological explanations and processes to explain behavior. And this is probably the biggest part um, of explaining behavior now that we have the technology to do so. And that is studying the brain and trying to explain behavior through brain processes. And um, that'll be our third unit that we study, but we'll talk all about the brain. Um, a couple names in this section, James Old, uh, was famous for studying the brain and kind of stimulating different parts of the brain in um, different animals and then seeing like what was the response. Like if I touch this part of the brain, do they move their paws or do they get hungry or sleepy? Uh, and then Roger Sperry did some studies on left and right brain um, specialization um, about how different parts of the brain control different sides of the body. But the biological perspective and neuroscience, definitely um, a fast growing field in psychology. Evolutionary psychology uh, looks for behavioral patterns in terms of evolutionary significance. So this kind of goes back to William James's theories. Um, but most specifically, evolutionary psychology is based off of Charles Darwin's theories um, of evolution. So the central premise is that natural selection occurs for behavior as well as physical characteristics. So Darwin kind of focused more on animals and survival of the fittest. Uh, but here it's really looking at what traits do we have today that help promote survival? Um, a lot of this um, has kind of moved into looking at um, what we look for in partners um, in both like relationships, but also like sexual partners. Um, and we'll talk about this in the motivation chapter, but David Buss is one of the current names and he's still around today. Um, and he says that a lot of what we look for in a partner is evolutionary. Um, he studied natural selection of mating preferences uh, in people all over the world, not just in the US, uh, and looked at jealousy, aggression, sexual behavior, language, decision-making, personality, and development. Um, he did studies where they asked women, you know, what do you look for in a partner? And men, what do you look for in a partner? And what he found was that men tended to look more for physical traits like hips and breasts. And women tended to look more for emotional support and things that would show that a male would be a better provider. Um, and that he said that that had to do with the way um, that men and women differed in their desire to get their genes out into the next generation. That men, because they can have more children um, or father more children, uh, tended to look for partners that look like they could have babies. And hips and breasts tend to indicate that a woman can have babies. Whereas because women would only have a few children, they were looking for a partner that would around to help take care of them. 
So he says a lot of the behaviors that we have today when it comes to looking for a partner still kind of are leftovers from those evolutionary traits of earlier humans. Um, so it's thought provoking, but of course, anything evolution related is definitely going to gather a lot of criticism. Um, our newer approach, and this is a very contemporary one, is the socio-cultural perspective. Um, so traditionally, actually I should say historically, um, psychology was made up of middle and upper class white males who were studying middle and upper class white males, primarily at the universities um, where they did their research. So a lot of the theories didn't necessarily apply to the broader population. So today, psychology is looking at, well, do those theories from early on really apply to people today, to women and to people of different races? Um, ethnocentrism, our vocabulary word here, is viewing one's own group as superior and as the standard for judging. So the idea here is that a lot of the early theories were ethnocentric, and they're considering maybe we should take a broader view today and consider how our cultural groups, our genders, how they affect our experience. So by the 1980s, there was increased interest in how cultural factors influence our behavior. Um, so looking at growing global interdependence, cultural diversity, and how your culture affects your behavior. Um, and then probably the newest um, approach to explaining behavior is what we call the biopsychosocial approach. Uh, and it is looking at a combination of three things, biological influences, so coming from the brain as, as well as genetics, psychological influences, and then your social and cultural influences. The, the three of those combined are affecting your mental processes. So again, biological, your genetic predispositions, uh, maybe some things that your are genetic mutations. Uh, your learned fears, your emotional responses, some cogni cognition or cognitive effects. Um, and again, how, what about the presence of others, uh, peer groups, your culture, society, the media? How do all of those affect your behavior? So probably this is the most contemporary of all the approaches that we will talk about. Uh, looking at some of the diversity in psychology, which as I mentioned, there hasn't been a whole lot in early psychology, but today, definitely a much more diverse field. Uh, we already mentioned in the last section, Margaret Floyd Washburn was the first female to earn a PhD in psychology. Mary Wooden Hawkins uh, was the first female president of the APA. Uh, some people of color, Frances um, Cecil Sumner was the first African-American to earn a PhD in psych uh, in 1920. Inez Beverly Prosser, the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in psych in 1933. Uh, and then Kenneth and Mammy Phipps, Mamie Phipps Clark uh, are known for playing a big part uh, in the end, the fight to end the racial segregation of public schools in 1954. That is it for flipped notes 1.2.